Hey, coming up next on Ham Nation, K3LR, Tim Duffy from DX Engineering is back to, you know, he brought us RFI 101 a few weeks ago. We're back with RFI 201, part two. We've got Amateur Radio Newsline and uh, Dr. T with Solar. We've got uh, Gordon with Hamfest information. We've got George with more on multimeters and all kinds of cool stuff. It's all coming up right now here on Ham Nation. So watch, okay? Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. Most in-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. This is Ham Nation, episode number 390, for February 20th, 2019. K3LR Talks RFI. Good evening, everybody. It's Wednesday night, as long as you're watching live, that is. It's Wednesday night. Uh, I'm not sure what time it is when you're watching, but, but I'm watching right now, and it's Wednesday night live, and we're, uh, this is a little program we like to call Ham Nation. It's all about amateur radio and uh, various things like that. And tonight we've got uh, a nice guest. We've got Tim Duffy, uh, K3LR, with us all the way up there from DX Engineering. We're going to talk RF stuff uh, a little bit later on here. How are you doing tonight, sir? Good to see you in here. Great to see you, Don. Doing well here in western Pennsylvania. Good deal. Awesome. Uh, over on the west coast, we've got Gordon West, WB6NOA. How are you doing over there? Um, we are fine. We're back from our travels, and we wish everyone with the Long Island Mobile Amateur Radio Club a great Sunday event. If you're in New York, get up to Hicksville, um, uh, Hicksville, New York, at the Leventown Parkway, because Sunday, February 24th, is your Long Island Mobile Amateur Radio Club um, get together. It's it's a fun event, and then next week we'll talk about uh, ham classes in Arizona and Lincoln, Nebraska. So plenty going on. But see you Sunday at the Limar get together in Hicksville. Sounds like a uh, worthwhile endeavor. Up to my north in Jackson, Mississippi, we got George W five JDX. Uh, any uh, transmitter tales for us tonight? What's going on with you? Uh, none really uh, as catastrophic as last time. I, I do have a three phase blower that burned up, and we all know how bad that smells. And that, of course, you can't get the parts, but that's another whole story. Don, I booked my flight for Dayton yesterday, so we're we're lining up here, uh, getting ready to head up there in May. Looking forward to another great year. And tonight on Smoke and Solder, I've got test equipment, and I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> Good deal. Good deal. Well, we're, I'm not sure I'm going to make it to Dayton, but I will make it to Huntsville because that's the uh, Young Ham of the Year Award presentation. And March 1st is the beginning of the nominating period for Young Ham of the Year. So uh, go to arnewsline.org and click on that YHOTY tab after March 1st or on March 1st or after, and you'll find the 2019 nominating form. Can't believe it's uh, Young Ham of the Year time already. And our friends at WTWW want to say hello to the listeners there. They're they're listening to us on the big blowtorch, 5085 and uh, 15.810. Uh, if you'd like to uh, give them a little feedback, email at WTWW.us. There's some great amateur radio programming on there, the, the QSO show on Tuesday nights. We've got Bob Heil uh, with organ music on the weekend and uh, uh, oldies with great, wonderful disc jockeys and just all kinds of cool stuff on WTWW, so uh, check that out, WTWW.us. And, of course, TWIT is doing the 2019 survey, so you want to check that out at, uh, at TWIT. Uh, I'm not sure. What is the survey link? Uh, oh, here it is, twit.to slash survey19. 
that's uh, what you want to go to to tell uh, Twit exactly what it is you like about uh, what we're doing here or any of your other shows on Twit. So uh, check out the Twit survey. Good stuff tonight. Let's get right into uh, right into our guest. Uh, he did a segment on RFI issues and problems uh, a few weeks back, and it was hugely successful. So we have him back again for uh, a, a second part, and I'm sure there'll be a third and a fourth. So Tim Duffy, K3LR from DX Engineering. Uh, how are you tonight in your red shirt? Hey, doing great, Don. We just had a, a big contest here over the weekend, the ARRL DX International CW Contest. So still a little foggy from uh, not having enough sleep, but we had 11 operators here, and the radios are still on. The bands were hot, uh, even without sunspots. Uh, we had a great time. But, you know, uh, after we did the first show about RFI and about um, noise and interference, we got so many emails between uh, Bob and myself. And uh, so we thought we'd do a little follow-up because we've had a few new products at DX Engineering that have been introduced now that can really help a lot of hams deal with noise. And noise is such a huge issue. So, Victor, do you have the, uh, the stack there? There we go. This is, uh, we just introduced this product uh, last Friday. And uh, thank you, Victor, for putting up these slides. This is the, the DX Engineering ISO Plus. And what this is, is a, a filtering system that is used on computer Ethernet networks. And so if you have um, Ethernet that connects your computer, uh, your DSL modem, uh, any anything that has an RJ45 jack, um, you'll notice that many times hams will have birdies. Every 16 kilohertz, maybe every 24 kilohertz from the Ethernet network that comes along with your computer. And so these filters, use one at each end of the line, are extremely effective. Uh, in fact, uh, W3TMB bought uh, 30 of these last Friday, and he had them overnighted to him so he could get them on Saturday. And he reports on Facebook. Uh, on the DX Engineering page, he said, my noise floor dropped significantly after I put in these ISO pluses. So a real bad problem that hams had with wired Ethernet connections was uh, to have interference uh, from the birdies that are created uh, through switches, modems, routers. And also, uh, some guys have had trouble when they would transmit, even with 100 watts, they would take down their computer or affect their wives, you know, iPad, so forth. This filtering system takes care of that. So the ISO Plus, it's so new and revolutionary, we've applied for a patent. So really, really cool stuff. So, Victor, go on to the next slide. You know, we talked about RF in the shack. And, Don, this is a real problem for a lot of guys if they are using antennas that need antenna tuners and the radio is uh, doing the lion's share of the job, you can have a lot of RF in the shack. And so uh, one of the things that's in the uh, Ward Silver grounding and bonding book is radio ground planes. And so guys said, geez, I, I don't want to have to uh, worry about going and get the copper sheet, having to drill it and mount it. So we did all the hard work. We got the hardware, we got the copper sheet, you put it underneath your radio, and this provides the common ground point for all of the items that are in your station. If it's a tuner, a computer, your radio, your power supply, and this can make a big difference, especially if you're on the second floor, you don't have a really good ground. Uh, the, getting a ground plane underneath the radio can make a huge difference. You know, a, a lot of us get bit on the on the lips because there's so much RF in the shack, and the radio ground plane can really help that. So there's good science behind this. It's in Ward's book. You can read more about it, but it's an in-stock item now at DX Engineering. And, Victor, go ahead to the next slide. And when you're doing your bonding um, between the radio uh, to your your common point ground 
or uh, in, an amplifier, a tuner, you want to use good quality tin copper braid. And why is the tinning important? Well, it's important because uh, otherwise, if it's just bare copper, it's going to oxidize. And it's not going to be as efficient as it should be. So it's good to, this is tin copper braid. I like to use the one inch stuff. That's what's here. You know, it's one inch wide and uh, we solder these lugs on the end so that it makes it very easy to install. You only want to use this indoors. You don't want to use this outside because uh, Don and Gordo, I, I know you guys know this, this, the braid will wick water and it will uh, really corrode and it will not be efficient. So you don't want to use braid outside. You want to use solid conductors outside, either solid strap or uh, we sell a number two uh, copper tinned wire as well. You want to use solid conductors outside. But inside, it's nice to have these flexible connections and the tin copper braid. We have them in, in many lengths. And, of course, we'll create them in any length you want through the custom cable builder at DX Engineering. And uh, go ahead, Victor, with the next slide. And sometimes if you have hums and hisses uh, between your headphones, maybe you've got a mixer going on, one of the things that we have found is very effective is the BHI Groundbreaker, which can uh, break apart any ground loops that you have in your station. And uh, that can be very valuable. I know George knows all about ground loops. And so if you have hums and hisses, maybe your microphone, when you get on the air, um, you hear some humming, that could be a potential ground loop. Where you have multiple points of grounding, you only want one. And if you have more than one, sometimes that, that makes it a loop and it can introduce hum. So uh, we have the BHI groundbreaker that can be very effective. Next slide. And for those of you who, who have really serious noise problems, uh, at DX Engineering, we have the NCC2. And the NCC means noise canceling controller. Every day we get many messages about guys that are having trouble with noise. You know, you turn on the radio and the noise on 20 meters is S9 or 20 over 9. And, I mean, there's no fun in that. Uh, the noise-canceling controller is a very sophisticated, well-engineered system. It has two channels to it, an A channel and a B channel. And uh, in most applications, what you do is the A channel is your antenna system, and then the B channel is your noise antenna. You, you actually get an antenna that is designed to pick up noise. And if you can get that noise antenna very well located right to the noise, then you can actually use the balance and phase controls to take out the noise. So it's, it's basically taking the noise 180 degrees out of phase. It's the same way the the, the Bose noise canceling headphones work is taking uh, what you don't want 180 degrees out of phase and it can make the noise disappear. This has been a lifesaver for uh, hams that are in locations that have very high noise levels and the noise canceling controller is that savior. Next slide. So uh, if here's another way to fight noise on the HF bands. This is the RF Pro 1B uh, loop, magnetic loop antenna. And what this does is you actually rotate this. It, it only needs to be 10 feet above the ground. And uh, you can use a, uh, a simple TV rotator that, that we have. We, we sell a, a nice little simple rotator. And you, you orient the loop so that it nulls the noise. And it is a great antenna. It's omnidirectional, but it has a very good pattern that allows you to null the noise. So this is another way to deal with noise. And uh, so the magnetic loop antenna you can use to actually null out the noise by locating the loop in the null and uh, taking out the noise, and then you'll be able to, to hear signals. Next slide. So uh, we had... Uh, a discussion via email with one of the Ham Nation uh, 
viewers about, hey, what's what's this deal with the crossover that we see inside of the DX engineering balance and uh, DX engineering chokes? And so on the left hand side in the photo here, you see the crossover and on the right hand side is kind of a typical way of winding uh, coax. This is RG400 uh, wound around uh, a stack of two number 31 ferrite cores. And the issue is, is that if the input and the output are close together, they couple. And the, uh, the common mode impedance is not as high. So you want to have these, these, the input and the output exactly 180 degrees apart. And you see here that with the crossover method, the, that's the red line in this graph. And you get over 5,000 ohms of common mode impedance uh, at the peak. And you can see the, the difference if you just wind the toroid like you would naturally wind it. It's uh, significantly lower, you know, several hundred ohms lower in common mode impedance. So um, that's the reason for the crossover. Go ahead with the next slide, Victor. And so this is a great book, the RFI book by the ARRL that really goes in depth with a lot of radio frequency interference uh, uh, techniques, uh, how to find it, how to solve it, and uh, what, what you're in for. And I, I suggest anybody that is, is plagued by noise, you get this book and really review it because it is, uh, boy, it, you know, it's got stuff in there about electric vehicles now and digital television, but this is a, a frequent reference book that I use in fighting RFI at my station. Next slide. And uh, we talked about this the last time, but this book is absolute gold because Ward Silver really did his homework, did a lot of research, and the grounding and bonding book is the absolute standard for how you should put together your amateur radio station. I don't care if you're on the ground floor, if you're in the basement, you're on the second floor. The techniques in this book are outstanding. They've been vetted by professionals, and Ward did a tremendous job. Uh, every club should have this book and lend it out to its members because it really explains all of the science behind grounding and bonding. Next slide. And so that's where we are tonight. You know, I mean, I, I have things like chokes and balance all over the shack here at K3LR. And uh, here's that crossover method again, the dual stack. Notice the uh, blues, which means uh, these are number 31. And uh, the chart for ferrite is at dxengineering.com so that you know whether you got number 40, uh, 43 and number 75, number 31. Um, they're all color-coded at DX Engineering. And uh, don't forget, every station should have lots of these ISO pluses to get the birdies out on your HF station coming from your Ethernet network. So, Don, that's what we have here this evening. And I, I guess Amanda is going to uh, collect questions and we'll stick around and answer every question we can here tonight. Perfect. You know, I, I have noticed regular birdies on the... Uh on the screen of the 7600 and i bet you that's i had no idea what they were from it's like i gotta be something it's probably the cable modem sitting right up there right yep yeah and yeah. and if little, the station you want to work don is on is that on bird. that birdie yeah oh. yeah it, oh it's terrible as in, invariably they are and uh you know the the pass band i can kind of get it out with the pass band on the 7600 but not all the way uh, and yeah it's just it's infuriating and, and then i'll at that point i'll just turn the radio off and you know, go drink or something, but so that's not good for. Well, <laughs> good I don't want my... you to turn the radio off. You can drink no. while you're on the radio, but don't turn the radio off. Get rid of the birdies. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. I may have to. I may have to invest in a couple of those. That's uh, that's good stuff. Uh, Gordon, do you have anything to add uh, to what we're talking about with RFI? Because uh, you and Tim are kind of the brain trust uh, in here, along with George. I'm just a. I'm just a trained monkey. No, I use a ton of DX engineering braid. And yes, that braid inside really is great to work with. It's not finger cutting like copper foil was that I used before. And the whole station that you see here has braid running from one rig to another. And Ward Silver 
he goes to ham fests and he just says it like it is. And it's what Tim indicated. Uh, he's the master along with Tim on yes. resolving RFI. And he is always there at the ham fest to be first to talk over everyone's personal RFI problems. Back to you, Don. Yeah, Ward's a genius. Uh, he sure is. The guy knows his stuff. Uh, George, anything to add tonight to the RFI discussion? Uh, just that I need to look at that book. I just received it. Uh, I renewed uh, my ARRL membership for another year, and you could check in there because I waited a month late to do it. You can check for a free book in there, and that's the book that I chose. So I'm looking forward to looking at that. RFI, yeah, all those things talked uh talked about by Tim there, work, and I've actually used uh, not that particular noise counselor, but a noise counselor that works on a similar principle, and yeah, it can definitely clean up a signal and get rid of a noise where before you couldn't even hear there was a, a signal there, and you take it out, phase that noise out, and it booms right on through. Same deal with the loop antenna, you know, I really like those. I've got one here as well, very similar to that one. Know that noise out or peak the signal you're looking for. Uh, a lot of times, all you got to do is know the noise out and the signal will come on through, you know. So um, th those are good, a uh, couple of good solutions there where you've got really a, a horrendous noise in your area and nothing yeah. else seems to do it. Those two can really come through. Good stuff. Well, this is this is the book right here, DX Engineering Catalog. Uh, the new stuff isn't in this one yet because, you know, they come out like four times a year. This is the uh, autumn and winter 2018. So we should be having uh, one of the new 2019 books coming out here uh, before too much longer. And that'll be showing up in your in your mailbox. Uh, a great resource for everything ham radio. Not not just a not just a toy catalog. There's there's good information in here. And of course, it's uh, you know, it, it, it has the phone number to DX Engineering and to the Brain Trust over there. Yeah, so that's <laughs> that, that's what you want. That's what you want. And since we're talking about DX Engineering, you know, uh, they're excited to announce that they have uh, added new trusted brands to their extensive list of ham radio providers. Those are Top Tech Amplifiers and Gator Cases. The Gator Cases equipment uh, rack cases are a smart choice for safely uh, carrying and uh, storing your gear. They're virtually indestructible, molded polyethylene. The cases are ideal for housing radios, power supplies, tuners, whatever you put in your emergency go kit. They feature recessed steel butterfly twist latches, the pro stuff that keeps the removable front and rear lids secure, just like you see on road cases that traveling musicians use. That's the good stuff. The cases are available in rack heights of four to six units with depths of either 14 and a quarter or 19 inches. And of course, DX Engineering carries extra panel shelves and hardware to customize your case to exactly what you need. From Top Tech come uh, finely built UHF and VHF power amplifiers. The 100 watt UHF model is perfect for FM, uh, single sideband CW, and digital mode operation on the 70 centimeter band. Among the many features, it comes with automatically enabled silent fans a bandpass filter, receiver low noise amplifier, and a switch for automatic SSB delay and peak power metering. The 85-watt VHF model includes front panel power and SWR metering, built-in low noise receive preamp, automatic fault for high SWR over 2 to 1 on the 2-meter band, and both units feature multiple protections and straightforward controls for easy operation. And back in stock, the beautifully printed and laminated DX and grid square maps from CQ Maps these are perfect for dolling up your shack. Put them on the wall. Oh, man, you, you're not going to know how to act. Your stuff's going to look so nice. The CQ Maps uh, 24 by 36 inch full color world map it includes World DX entities, accurate CQ amateur radio zones, and recent political borders. The full color Maidenhead Grid Square Locator U.S. map shows all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands, state capitals, corresponding four digit grid squares. It's a 24 by 36 inch version printed on heavyweight coated paper or a compact 19 by 13 inch version on matte paper. Everything you need is, is right there at DX Engineering on the website in the catalog and DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. If you get your order in by say 10 p.m. Eastern uh, tonight and if it's in stock, it'll be on a truck headed your way tonight. 
With proven products and expert advice, DX Engineering is helping you shrink the globe. The catalog is there. You can uh, grab that or, of course, shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. And, of course, we appreciate Tim Duffy, K3LR, and everybody there at DX Engineering for their support of what we do here on Ham Nation. We we kind of like Gordon West, too, every, every now and then. What, what do you got? What do you got for us tonight, Gordon? Um, we're going to go RVing. So hang on, everybody, to your trailer hitches. Uh, we're going to head to the big RV world of HamFest via a recreational vehicle. So, Victor, if you'll go ahead and beam us up, here comes RVing. Our first one was Mesa, Arizona in December. And the neat thing about RVing is you can stay pretty much wherever you want to, and you never know who you're going to meet. At the uh, Mesa, Arizona Ham Fest, uh, it was a good one. Um, it was more of a giant, uh, well orchestrated swap meet. There were seminars at a distant location. Well, you could walk there, but the big deal was the swap meet. And that's uh, Roger and Kim's uh, uh, little get together with LEDs. But the big deal was they explained everything for new hams, such as putting up a tower. And uh, you actually uh, watched as uh, new hams were intrigued to see what it takes to put together one of those multi-band antennas and um, what it takes to climb a tower professionally. And uh, he was up just to the first level. That's why he doesn't have the hard hat on. It was just pretty much show. But let me tell you, they at the Mesa, Arizona Ham Fest really did a terrific job of making things happen. And of course, in Mesa, Arizona is uh, QRZ.com, and we hope all of you will look at QRZ.com for the latest news, for taking sample exams, for all sorts of great publications available. They make it happen with ham news at QRZ, QRZ.com, and they were there live and direct. Well, then we head to Quartz Fest. Now, Quartz Fest, we hit a thousand plus attendees, a new record. But starting off Quartz Fest was the Quartz Fest Amateur Radio Association. And that association, their mission is get more kids involved with ham radio. And they set up on the opening day of Quartz Fest, and that is Dave and Heather. Dave and Heather work with the school districts throughout uh, the La Paz Valley area, and they bring ham radio to kids. Well, I mean, not just a handheld. Well, maybe a handheld. The whole deal was they had a great demonstration of robotics. Now, this robot is seeking with a camera to find its uh, target, the secret spot. And look at the kids. They're using handhelds with a touchstone pad to be able to guide that robot by watching the screen. A little hard to see the screen in the Arizona sunshine. But let me tell you, those kids navigated that robot to the secret spot with the camera and bingo this gets a lot of kids excited about ham radio and all it can do over the airwaves also out there was gary and ray and um, they were uh, setting up for the vhf uhf contest last january and uh, gary is the uh, one that is uh, the one that sets up the big huge pa systems we have it covered right now it was not yet on the air but uh, gary just does a fabulous job of making sure that whoever he works with gets set up properly and let me tell you when he makes things happen he makes things happen to the big, yeah, it works. And that was, of course, Ray uh, operating the VHF UHF DX contest from his uh, communications unit. Oh, yeah, just a small little communications unit. But, you know, what a guy. He came in um, uh, under the wraps and he set up everything with Gary and he just operated for the full weekend and he was having fun. Well, I would, too, with a 9100 on the bottom, <laughs> on top of that, the 7800, and on top of that, the 9700, the brand new uh, VHF UHF multi-mode rig, and, of course, Ohio Pro 7 headset to uh, go along with the works. So Ray was having a lot of fun. 
One of the neat things that they did that all of you that uh, organize ham fest should consider is they had everybody bring their radio and one leader would take folks around for both looking at solar panels as well as looking at antennas on the RVs. No PA system necessary. If you came with your little handheld, you held it up to your ear, and on uh, extremely low power, the uh, key operator would describe each of the rigs and let the rig owner describe what they have. Chris is our fearless leader, KR1SS. Our leader takes us to the ladies' corner. And this is great in that Quartz Fest really plays to everyone who either loves ham radio or puts up with those of us that play ham radio all the time. And let me tell you, the ladies were having a ball. So I encourage all of you, take the lead from Chris, and that is have some strong ladies programs, great ladies programs, and uh, take them into town, take them out of the town, take them RVing. Uh, they will have a terrific time, and that will help your ham fest grow. And the wind system was there. That's the um, uh, Western Intertie Network. And the wind system um, was uh, IRLP and Echolink and D-Star. They come up on many different modes, but they had great success in getting newcomers on the air and seeing what it's like to be able to talk to beyond just the local repeater area, talk through the Internet literally around the country. We also had some good times in trying out new uh, pieces of equipment. This is the matching amplifier to the MFJ new uh, Chinese uh, mobile radio. And um, so far, it is working out well, and it's still under test. Then we head down to Orlando, Orlando, Florida. And Don, yes, <clears throat> with marshmallows. There are alligators in that lake, so we didn't get too close. But we love the ingenuity of some of the Florida hamsters that uh, put their VHF, UHF, and SHF station um, along with Arden and all of the uh, ATV in one nice, neat little package for towing. And um, for the seminar tents uh, in the warm Florida weather, no. Oh, that's not big coax. That's big air conditioning with the air conditioner units a long way away. The tents were quiet. The air was cool. This is what organizers do ahead of time, thinking about what it's going to be like to keep everybody cool during the seminars. Bob Heil was there, and he had some wonderful attendees at the seminars. Uh, this is John and Michael. They make things happen. They were the uh, leaders of the Orlando Hamcation. And they were not just in a spot uh, taking the spotlight. They were working hard to make sure the exhibitors, making sure that the swappers, multiple swap meet areas, that everybody was having a great time and things were moving smoothly. They were there at 0600 when I got there and they were still performing uh, all sorts of operations late in the evening. So if you're doing a ham fest, have those that will turn out in style. And there's Carol Perry, WB2, mighty good professor, getting the award from the uh, Orlando Hamcation uh, Committee and uh, some of the past organizers, Peter, of the Hamcation, um, making things happen. So let me tell you, quality, quality presentation. Well, we had to leave um, the warm Florida to uh, Yuma, and um, we were greeted with uh, a lot of snow, um, but it didn't keep the hams back from uh, coming to Yuma, even though some coming and some going uh, uh, through the winds in uh, the Arizona desert lost a little bit out of their, uh, out of their uh, vehicle or uh, out of their uh, fifth wheel. Yep. Lost that guy right on out. But hams, no problem. A little duct tape, ready to roll. Tracy and Jody, and uh, that is Tesla, uh, the pooch. Uh, they were there, and they go, no problem. If it's cold, we've got it made because they're from the Lake Arrowhead area. Tracy, of course, was the one that did all the Quartz Fest logistics on the computer. Uh, the neat thing about Yuma, again, were the hams. The hams serving that committee had little go-karts, and every RV that came into the Yuma 
fairgrounds, and this was a wonderful fairgrounds, they got a personal escort right to their RV spot. And, of course, everybody has to have a special spot, and they made it happen. Uh, that Friday night uh, was the uh, Quartz Fest uh, wrap-up get-together and a hot dog roast. But, you know, look at all that food. Is that just stuff like materialize? No, it's brought by volunteers who have pre-scheduled and preset who's going to do what. And the ladies were there uh, doing the buns and the burgers and the hot dogs. Well, no boogers, burgers, but uh, plenty of hot dogs. They are what make things happen. And uh, the Yuma Ham Fest certainly drew uh, some of the big uh, uh, exhibitors, including Flex Radio. And Flex was not just there uh, showing off equipment, but rather they were giving instructions to those that came up saying, tell me all about this uh, new digital mode FT8. They would bring it up and look at this. They had plenty of instructional materials right on their own units to uh, show those that came into the booth. <laughs> For those that decided to stay a little bit uh, on the outside of the booth, uh, they had the Maestro that was totally portable, yet tied right into the big rigs for all sorts of digital as well as analog modes. Well, every good uh, ham radio convention has a great uh, swap meet. And uh, the swappers had both a grass area at Yuma as well as a, a cement paved area. A lot of neat things. And on the inside, uh, the largest of the ham radio dealers, Ham Radio Outlet, was there. And uh, that is a good old Dave, WZ6X. Dave's on 75 meters with an old uh, military uh, uh, radio telephone. And it's live. It really works. And uh, everybody thought, yeah, that's sort of weird. But he made contact with another station hundreds of miles away in the late afternoon on 75. <laughs> it points out that even some of the older gear really works out special. And also, uh, Yuma did something that I hope other ham fest will always do, and that is for the exhibitors. They have an exhibitor that exhibitor assistant that will come around with cold drinks just to keep those exhibitors happy in the booth and well uh, lubricated. And that is neat. That's like taking special care of everyone who makes a ham radio ham fest happen. So... Um, we encourage all of you that if you get a chance, uh, go to Limark uh, this coming Sunday. But above all, do a ham fest. Thank the ham fest committee because holy schmoly, here's three to 400 hamsters that were fed in less than about 45 minutes. And they had a great time at the Yuma Ham Radio, the Southwestern Division ARRL Convention in Yuma. And, of course, we had a lot of the ARRL brass there as well. So that was our tours with the comm van and uh, that uh, little flat panel that you see to the right of the front wheel. That is a, that's right, that's a direct TV SATCOM flat panel phased array, and it did just great wherever we would go coast to coast to pick up a direct TV. <laughs> so, and of course, uh, the pink pig, you got to have that for ham radio fun. So <coughs> I encourage all of you that if you want to really play ham radio, take in a convention. Thank those that put it together and just know that it's a big, big deal to pull off a quartz fest, as Chris will tell you, or to pull off a, a hamcation or a Yuma or Mesa. These are big ham fests just out here and back there. You've got them all over the country, and we'll try and talk uh, briefly about each one each week here on Ham Nation. So thanks for making Ham Radio happen, you convention uh, put-togethers. And now let's go to George and find out What's new with George? Hi, George. Hi, Gordo. And it sounds like your road trips were well worth it this time around. Uh, some great activity there. I wish I had been at some of those ham fests as well. Uh, but uh, one day I'm going to make it down to Hamcation. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll get out to some out west again uh, before too terribly much longer as well. Well, you know, last week I talked about... Uh, test equipment and what you might need to get started. And the very first thing I showed was probably the world's ugliest test light. 
uh, one that I just strung together with some parts I had here in the shack. And I got an email from uh, Gene W4IQN. You may recognize uh, that call. Gene is the one who did all those great drawings of the pine board here for Bob that, uh, you know, we looked at uh, over the past year. And uh, every one of those he put together, and uh, excellent job on that. But he said he watched the segment and um, saw the little test light and said, yeah, while, you know, some people um, thought it was very simplistic and, you know, kind of primitive, you know, there's a lot of people out there who haven't acquired the skills to use a meter yet. And something like that can be just what they need to do some minor testing with. As a matter of fact, he sent me a photo here. And uh, this is his test light, one that he built. It's um, a 1.5-volt LED driver that was scrapped from an LED walkway light that he bought at Dollar Tree for a buck. He put a test lead on it there. He's got a nail stuck in it for the probe. And it's all built into a solder dispenser. So you can see there's a nice little hook there that you can hang it on your pegboard with. And he he says he uses it all the time. And if you got something like that hanging around, you know, sometimes it's it's more convenient for a quick continuity check. And if you don't have anything else, you know, like I said, you can tear your flashlight up and come up with something to check continuity with. So uh, thanks for that email, Gene. And I've got more test equipment this week. You know, I kind of left you hanging. We looked at, well, maybe not, but we looked at three different meters. Maybe, I think it was four different meters. But I had the old uh, Simpson 260 meter. And I had three different digital meters. I had uh, a really cheap 10 meter. I had a, l a little better Radio Shack meter. And then I had my Fluke meter. And we just talked about some of the differences between them. There's one thing we didn't really talk much about, though, that I want to show you this week. The fluke meter and the reason I bought this particular one, it's a true RMS meter. Uh, while most um, volt-ohm meters are not, they're average reading on AC voltages. And why would you want a true peak reading meter? Well, there's... You know, you don't necessarily have to have it for everything, but some things, it could mount up pretty big, uh, just depending on what you're working on and what kind of situations you're under. But I just wanted to take a look here at, well, we're going to look at my Rigol oscilloscope here, which incidentally has the math functions in it. So it can actually uh, give me several different types of voltage readings. I have it set here, though, to uh, show me uh, the true RMS value as it calculates it. And now, you know, I, I believe I've said before that an oscilloscope is not the best thing in the world to measure voltage with. I mean, yeah, it's great for looking at signals and stuff, but if you want an accuracy, you probably don't choose the oscilloscope first. You go to a meter. Over here, I've got that uh, little Radio Shack meter, and I don't remember the number on this one. This was... I don't know, maybe one of their upper ones. Uh, it's got a USB port on it, too, but I bought it for a little bit of nothing when they were going out of business. And then there's my Fluke uh, 115 over here that I carry with me. Now, I'm feeding those a sine wave right now. It's coming off a, a little cheap Tima audio oscillator here that, incidentally, has a really clean sine wave on it. I've measured it before, and it's uh, way below 1%. Uh, we can see the sine wave right here, just a typical sine wave. If we look at the meters now, this is a pure sine wave. This is probably like 0.1% distortion. We look at the Radio Shock meter, it's measuring 1.418 volts. Uh, the Fluke True RMS meter is reading 1.422 volts, so they're very, very close. You know, that's like what? Uh, 0.0 one or two difference between the two, not much. If we look over here, what the Rigol oscilloscope calculated this out to be is 1.44 volts. So it's a little bit in disagreement, not too far off, but these two basically agree with each other. You know, the um, on a pure sign and solar signal like that, an average reading meter is going to give you... Uh, 
you know, uh, probably just as good a reading as you'll get off a true RMS meter, uh, provided they're both, you know, properly calibrated. When you run into signals, though, that aren't sinusoidal or that maybe have some distortion in them, then the voltages are not going to measure the same because to get a true RMS reading, what you're trying to do is take the power of the voltage that's in that waveform and equate it to what the same amount of power would be in DC. So if you've got a really distorted waveform, the average reading meter is not going to know. All it's going to see is the peaks and try to average it out and determine, you know, what your voltage is there. It really can't analyze it and determine exactly what it is, but, you know, it'll give you a good idea. Let me give you an example here. If we go back and look again, okay, pure sine wave, they're both uh, substantially in agreement with each other there. Now let's uh, take that, let's flip this thing over and put it on a square wave. Well, things have changed a little bit. Now the Radio Shack meter, the average meter, says uh, 3.45 volts. The Fluke says it's only 3.129. So what's happened here is our average responding meter is reading, you know, around 10% higher than the true RMS voltage is on a square wave. The scope over here says 3.15, so it's actually closer to, to what the fluke says. Now let's complicate things a little bit more. What I'm going to do now is distort the waveform in a somewhat primitive manner here. Let's see. Okay, that looks plenty ugly. So let's see what we've got now. What this is is a 60 hertz wave that I've uh, sort of superimposed 120 hertz on top of it. So it's not a good sinusoidal wave there. It's kind of nasty looking. If we look at our meters over here now, well, they're kind of jumping around. You know, it's hard for them to really zero in on that. The fluke, it's kind of... Pinned it down to uh, 3.32, roughly, volts there, 3.32. The Radio Shack's dropping all the way down to 3 volts, so it's, it's actually reading a little low. What does the scope here say? Uh, about 3.34. It's sort of in agreement with the fluke here, so we can see that although this one's really dancing around because it it's having a hard time adjusting to this shifting waveform here. But you can see you're measuring quite a bit of difference there. Uh, I have seen this thing, uh, well, right before the show tonight when I was testing it out. This was like a half a volt lower than the fluke was reading. And then you say, well, half a volt. You know, what's, what's that? That's not much. Well... It just depends if uh, you've got a vacuum tube that, you know, maybe it goes for three or four thousand dollars, and it wants six point three volts on the filaments. You better put, uh, you know, a true six point three volts on those filaments, and not operate very much over, particularly not over. And you can go under a little bit, but uh, we've talked about that before. But you basically, you need to know exactly what voltage you're putting on the filaments of that tube. It's got a big effect on the life of it by as much as, uh, you know, the life can be doubled by managing your filament voltage properly. Now, not so much in the tubes that we use in amateur radio, but some of the ceramic tubes that are used in broadcast transmitters and such makes a big difference in tube life. And when you're spending three or four grand on a tube, yeah, you want it to last as long as you can. So that's what a true RMS meter does. It gives you um, a more accurate picture of what the actual true RMS voltage is of a waveform that might not necessarily be a pure sine wave. And with that, uh, 
A couple of things I want to mention here. One is, oh, why would you ever run across, uh, say, an AC signal that wasn't pure sinusoidal? Well, there could be some variable speed motor drives involved in there that will throw that way off. Uh, you could have some electronic ballast. Those won't put out a good pure sine wave. Computers won't. Uh, sometimes HVAC systems don't. And uh, solid state environments, uh, you know, it's a lot of occasions where you're not getting a pure sine wave. Uh, UPS power supplies are another uh, another one there that, you know, it's probably not a pure sine wave coming out of most UPSs. So keep that in mind. Uh, last week, I did ask a question since Gordo was not here. I said I was going to give away one of his books. And I pulled a question right out of the uh, new extra class study guide from Gordo. And this will be on your exam if you're going to take the extra. Which of the following represents a capacitive reactance in rectangular notation? Is it minus JX plus JX? Is it just X or is it omega? Well, that was a good question here. And you may not, you may have seen it and you didn't really know what it was on, uh, say, an antenna analyzer. But the correct answer on that is minus JX. And what the minus is, is that means it's uh, a negative uh, reactance. X means reactance. The J means you're looking at the imaginary part of the uh, impedance of the signal there. So minus JX is the answer. And our winner, uh, you know, a lot of folks got that right. A lot of folks did not get that one right. But our winner is Nick Jacks. Uh, KM6UBA, and he said capacitive reactance in rectangular notation would be minus JX. Uh, congratulations, Nick. Gordo is going to be sending one of his technician, general, or extra class study guides to you so that you can upgrade if, uh, if you're not already an extra, or you can help somebody else get licensed or get upgraded. Uh, great study guides here. Gordon West Amateur Radio Study Guides, the, the best out there, uh, for my money anyway. And for next week, I have another question. This one, well, it'll be uh, a little something to do with what we talked about tonight. And i uh, got a nice prize here. I've got another one of these DX Engineering canvas tote bags, a really heavy-duty tote bag here. I use this one to carry my coax in whenever I'm going to um, outdoor events, uh, field day, uh, whatever. It's a very heavy, rugged, duty uh, tote bag, uh, courtesy of DX Engineering. Uh, perfect for, for carrying whatever you got to carry when you're working those outdoor events. How would a DC voltage measure uh, or a DC voltage measurement compare if you were measuring it on an average responding uh, AC voltmeter versus a true RMS voltmeter, how would a DC voltage measurement compare using those two meters? If you think you know the answer to that, send it to me, hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you could win one of these uh, great DX engineering tote bags. And let's get a message from ICOM right now, and we'll be right back. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, is coming soon. This new radio is bringing direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. The IC9700 all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features, such as dedicated amateur satellite operation, color touchscreen, built-in D-Star capability, RF direct sampling on 2 meters and 70 centimeter bands, dual independent receivers capable of full duplex operation as well as dual watch, 100 watts maximum output power on 2 meters, 75 watts max on 70 centimeters, and 10 watts max on 1.2 gigahertz. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios.
Attention all hams. ICOM knows that ham clubs play a big role in bringing ham communities together to learn from their peers and industry leaders. As a way to give back and help you on your mission, ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively for U.S. ham clubs and the ham fest they're involved with. By registering your club, you could win ICOM swag, a Skype presentation for your club, or your ham fest an ICOM booth set up. Register today for your chance to win at icomamerica.com slash hams. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation and register to win some great swag prizes like T-shirts and hats. While you're there at registering, you'll automatically be entered in the grand prize drawing for a new radio. And for February, that's going to be the ID4100A entry-level D-Star Mobile with big rig features. It's a dual-band rig, one band at a time, analog and D-Star, upgraded user interface, built-in GPS included, DV fast data mode, near repeater search function, micro SD card for voice and data storage, and there's an optional UT-137 Bluetooth board available, and downloadable Android and iOS apps. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is uh, the D-Star radio that I use. I really like it. They've made some big improvements in the interface there. So I want you to go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation after this in each episode and register to win. Sign up. Good luck. And don't forget to follow Icom America Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And just a reminder, uh, Randy wants to see your photos and learn more about what you've been building, soldering, uh, wrenching or drilling uh, photos, please, no videos, and give them a little description on what it is you're building. And send them to k7age at outlook.com, and you could be in the next um, Show Us Your Project segment. And I think we may have one of those next week. A little birdie tells me that he's been working on one. So send those to Randy k7age at outlook.com. And now for all the news that's uh, worth being in the news from our expert newsman, Don Wilbanks. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2,155, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, February 20th, 2019. Oscar 100 is alive and well. Things just got a little more exciting for fans of Qatar Oscar 100, which is carrying the first geostationary amateur radio payload in history. Its two transponders have been inaugurated and have gone live online. A web SDR for the narrow band segment and a spectrum viewer for its wide band segment are being operated by the British Amateur Television Club and AMSAT UK. The Oscar 100 project has the support of Goonhilly Earth Station, which is hosting the ground station facility in Cornwall in the UK. Meanwhile, up above the Earth, Oscar 100 can be found in its geostationary orbit aboard the SHL-2 communication satellite at 25.9 degrees east. The satellite was launched on a Falcon 9 rocket from SpaceX at Cape Canaveral November 15 of last year. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Graham Kemp, VK4BB. Back here on Earth, satellites have landed at a Pennsylvania college in the form of a campus club. There's a new club on campus at Villanova University in Pennsylvania, and its ambitions are lofty, with good reason. The school's College of Engineering is now home to a CubeSat club, focusing on amateur radio nano satellites. Its faculty advisor is Alan Johnston, KU2Y, an associate teaching professor of electrical and computer engineering. The advisor's role is natural for him. Allen is Vice President for Educational Relations for AMSAT, a voluntary position he holds within the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation. Allen was named to his position at AMSAT in May of 2018 and was given the assignment to boost educational outreach and the role of amateur satellites as teaching tools. Club meetings, which are held on Wednesdays, provide students with what is often their first glimpse at satellite technology and the little CubeSats. According to the university's website, the ultimate goal of the club might be to launch its own mission to space, perhaps as a joint effort with another organization or university. For the meantime, club members already have a busy agenda here on Earth, building a CubeSat simulator based around a Raspberry Pi computer with a 3D printed frame and establishing a satellite ground station to be part of an automated open source global network. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Heather Emby, KB3TZD. 
In one California classroom recently, the students were from the military, but the curriculum was totally amateur. Radio, that is. Amateur radio operators in the United States military are old friends, dating back to the First World War. Once again, the two recently became classmates as well. This time, the teacher and students were in Point Magoo, California, home of a U.S. Naval Air Station. The classroom of Brian Hill, KF4CAM, was filled with 23 software engineers and developers from the Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division. They were there to prep for their amateur technician test. The one-week immersion session included a curriculum in RF propagation, antennas, and signal modulation. The instruction designed by Brian, who's been a ham since high school, had been crafted to supplement these students' computer science backgrounds by adding some relevant radio theory. The students recently passed their final exam, the FCC licensing test. Organizers say their next activity might well be something like a school field trip. It will likely be a fox hunt. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Dave Parks, WB8ODF. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Graham Kemp, VK4BB, Heather MB, KB3TZD, Dave Parks, WB8ODF, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the News Desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's the solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. We have a coronal hole that's rotating into the Earth's strike zone, and it could send us a solar storm. How will this affect you? That story and more in the forecast of tomorrow. <laughs> Space weather has been quiet, but things are beginning to pick up. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see some gorgeous solar tornadoes on the sun's west limb. That's a little something extra for you sun lovers, but that's not the big story. The big story is the coronal hole that is rotating into the Earth's strike zone. It's already beginning to send us some fast solar wind, and we're beginning to see its effects now. It could bring aurora down to high latitudes, possibly even down to mid latitudes here over the next couple days. So your aurora photographers, be sure to keep your batteries charged. Now, it also will be affecting GPS reception, especially at high latitudes, so those GPS users be aware of those issues. On top of that, we do have a bright region that is crossing through the Earth-facing disk right now. You can see it on the front side, but you can also see it on the back side, Sun. This region has been boosting the solar flux here over the last few days uh, for amateur radio operators and emergency responders, and it looks like it's going to continue to do that, so we will see some marginal radio propagation on Earth's day side easily over the next week. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are beginning to feel the effects from that fast wind from the coronal hole that is rotated into the Earth's strike zone. At high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active conditions with up to about a 40% chance of a major storm. Now, at mid latitudes, we're only expecting unsettled conditions, but we do have up to about a 30% chance for active conditions. And this will last here over the next couple days before things begin to calm down a little bit. But don't let that calm fool you, because in about 10 days, we have a chance for yet another solar storm. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, even though we have a bright region that's crossing the Earth-facing sun right now, it's not strong enough to be considered a sunspot, so the sun remains spotless. And this means we have no risk for radio blackouts or big flares. You can see everything is in the green, and this should make you GPS users on Earth's day side very happy. But the bright region is boosting the solar flux just a little bit. We're sitting here at the low 70s, which means we have marginal range for radio propagation and this should continue easily over the next week. Now also because we have essentially a solar minimum sun, we're getting more cosmic ray penetration than we normally would. So you frequent flyers, and this does include the air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high altitudes and high latitudes, you are in the marginal range for radiation dose and this does include you prenatal passengers, so please take this into consideration in your flight plans. So the space weather this week is getting very exciting. We're already beginning to feel the effects from that fast solar wind from the coronal hole that's rotated into the Earth's strike zone. And it could be bringing us some aurora down to high latitudes, possibly down to mid latitudes here over the next couple days. And this is good news for your aurora photographers. Just be aware you've got to compete with that bright moon uh, this week. So that could cause a few issues for you.
Now we also have a bright region that is rotating across the Earth facing sun and it is boosting the solar flux and keeping it into the low 70s. So you amateur radio operators and emergency responders enjoy some marginal uh, radio propagation on Earth's day side and you might have to deal with a few propagation issues on Earth's night side during that solar storm. Now, as far as the GPS users, well, you know, GPS reception on Earth's day side should look pretty good for you right now. And as long as you stay away from the dawn dust terminators and from high latitudes near the aurora at the night side, especially during that solar storm, your reception should be top notch. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. As always, if you're not following her on Twitter, you really should be at Tamitha Scove and also check her out at spaceweatherwoman.com. Uh, let's check out uh, another uh, another lady of amateur radio, and that, of course, is Amanda in the chat room. Hello, Amanda. What? Good evening, Two everybody. With your glasses. I like the glasses. I, I just got them. I just got glasses. Am I, like I cute? Them. Yeah. Okay. About, all right. That's all half. I needed to know. I'm good. Yeah, about half. All right. Yeah. Mr. Tim Duffy, I have a couple questions for you. Um, and this is not about where you've been last night. Let's see. Uh, this is a great one. <laughs> Where'd that come from? I have no idea. It just slipped out. I'm goofy. Oh, my God. You're rubbing <laughs> off on me. I was on 160 meters last night. Come on. <laughs> and what contacts did you make? Hey, that's the gentleman's hey, band. Don't contacts. give him no guff. Okay. <laughs> that's the gentleman's that's band. The gen it's the gentleman's <laughs> band, Amanda. Don't give him no guff. That's it. All right. My finger Thank at you. you. Well, Good enough alibi for me. All right. So this is not going to pertain to 160, uh, but let's say, what are some of the best antennas for portable work? You know, uh, portable work is very challenging, Amanda. And uh, it's not only portable work, but some of the emergency uh, type work that you can get into where you have to deploy very quickly. It's the same kind of antennas. So... Um, my favorite antenna for portable work is the Transworld TW antenna that we have here at DX Engineering. And that antenna can be deployed in five minutes. You can get on the air and you can work stations all over the place. So the uh, TW antenna, you know, goes in a nice package. Uh, a lot of guys that are going up on the summits on the air are using the TW antenna. It very easy, deployable, and uh, works very well on 80, 40, 20, 15, 10 meters, 17, 12. Uh, very easy uh, to get going. All right. Well, thank you for that. This is another interesting question. So Gordo brought up all of these RVs showing up at these ham fests, and they're they're really grouped very closely together. And guess what? At the end of the day, the ham fest is over. So they're all going to go back to the RVs and they're going to operate. What do you do to, to take away that interference? So they're not walking all over each other. You know, that that's really tough. Uh, I, I saw that uh, when Gordo and I were down at Hamcation a few weeks ago. There's all these antennas on these RVs and everybody's on like, 75 meters or 40 mm -hmm. meters and uh, so it comes down to having a good radio like an IC 7300 from ICOM which is a great radio but uh, there's not much you can do when you have an RV here and an RV next to you <laughs> and you're both wanting to use 40 meters at the same time that that is a real struggle so um, my recommendation is is if if your neighbor is on 40 meters, you go over and knock on the door and sit around the campfire and have a good time because there's not much you can do to operate on the same band mode at the same time. Probably. I mean, and we face the same thing even during field day, uh, right. you know, and you're on different bands. You still have that problem if you don't put the right filters in place. But I'm pretty sure you guys carry those filters. Yes, we have the fillers, and we get lots of calls about that, Amanda. I, I mean, that, that happens a, a lot at DX Engineering because, uh, you know, during field day, it's important to be able to work 40 meters and 20 meters. But we have these, these filters, these front-end filters, uh, bandpass filters that really take out all of the harmonic energy 
and allow field day operations, you know, on the various bands. So uh, we can help hams with that. Absolutely. Now, this is kind of a cool question. It's very, very, very open ended. But Chumley wanted to know, says, if you're building a new shack and you want to run the conduit, should you have a separate ground AC and coax conduit runs? Is that sufficient? Is that too much? Is that overthinking it? No, it's not overthinking it. You know, uh, grounding, when you're, you're building a new shack, it's very, very important. Um, here at K3LR, we actually have ground rods in the floor of the shack right behind me. Um, I've got 13 ground rods in the floor. So I put those ground rods in before we poured the concrete for the floor here in the basement shack. And uh, so there is an AC ground that's very important to have uh, because that, that protects you from all sorts of problems with your AC uh, voltage uh, system and then there's the station ground and uh, you want to bond that at one point there should be a bond one wire between the AC ground and the station ground but the the Bible on this whole thing is the Ward Silver book grounding and bonding and he explains in there he's got photos in there and it's very easy to follow so I would recommend that he gets that book before he does any of the uh, the work in the new shack. All right, thank you very much. I, and I'm not trying to put Tim down here, but what is your real world world uh, grounding, Don? Do you do it that way? No, oh, my whole sh my, <laughs> my whole situation here is it's a temporary setup. I, I've got. I've got 50 feet of tower that's laying on its side in the garage that one of these years is going to go up. So everything is temporary. I've got wires strung through the air. I've got uh, this literally probably like like 80 percent, I would say, or maybe even more of the ham radio shacks that are out there probably are not grounded the way they should be. And mine is definitely one of those. So, uh, yeah, I, I've got some work to do around here. I, I agree. <laughs> and George, are, is yours is yours good? You got it right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I don't have uh, as many ground rods as Tim does, but what I do have is, is quite similar. I've got a rack over here that's um, got all my gear in, and I'm in a, a metal building here. It's 12 by 24 feet, and so it has a wood floor in it, and it's uh, you know, a couple of feet off the ground. Directly up under that rack, I've got my station ground rod going down, and I have a piece of uh, two-inch wide copper strap that comes up from that and runs the length of that rack that has all my gear in. And coming off of it, I've got uh, short jumpers of braid, just like we looked at earlier here tonight, connecting each of my pieces of gear to that uh, common metal ground strap. And okay, then there's so one connection. Yeah, there's one connection from it. No, that's not normal. That's how everybody does it. <laughs> In theory. In theory. <laughs> that's the way you're supposed to, but honestly, like we we have right next to me here is my washer and dryer. Behind it, we have holes drilled out to our house, and that's where our feed line goes. And Jeff is just like, Oh God. Oh, uh, sorry. But we don't have anything ran through conduit. It's it's a mess honestly, but hey, it makes the contacts. I'm not saying that that's the right way to do it, but it, I, I'm, what do you think, Tim? How many people actually do it that way? You know, not enough. And uh, <laughs> and every day we, we get calls from hams all over the world uh, that have grounding problems and bonding problems, or they have RF in the shack, you know, and they say, geez, my radio doesn't work well uh, when I when I transmit it shuts down, um, has has trouble, you know, and then we get into ferrite, we get into grounding and bonding. So I think your number of 80% is right. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 you know, a lot of them are just like Don. Just throw it up, get on the air, and have fun. And sometimes right. that works just fine. But if that doesn't work fine, you've got to get the, you know, Ward Silver religion and, and actually bond stuff together and ground stuff 
So little by little, and that's what Ham Nation is all about, you know, teaching uh, the right way to do things and and look at these books, look at look at how others are doing it. There's lots of great things on the Internet on how to ground and bond, uh, but get Ward's book. That'll set you straight. And, uh, you know, do I need to send one to Jeff? Is that is that what we're getting to here, Amanda? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. And a new, answer for a new washing machine for Amanda. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, and I'm very serious, though. I think that that's a really overwhelming thing to a lot of people. It's just like, bah! so I'm going from my house to my antenna. Now what? Where does this oh, yeah. go? And how do I make it look good? Um, so I think it's an important issue. And we don't talk about it a lot. And there's so many different options. I, we, And we've shown our own setups before, but I'd really like to see some other people's out there. Send those to Randy, you guys. If you have yeah. pictures of like your bus bar or how it's exiting your house, send it there to him go. and maybe we can um, set up a segment about that because I would find it fascinating, honestly. And I'd like it to be prettier in my house as well. So. Yeah, you With know, I think that, most people when they get when they get the new radio, it, it it comes in the in the in the fancy DX engineering box with you know th from the UPS truck, or they they get it at the ham fest or or whatever, and you know it's the new toy, the shiny new thing, and they come home and they can't wait to get it out of the box and, and onto the bench, and you put it there and you jack your antenna in the back of it and you start operating. Oh, this is great, and then the details get lost by the wayside, and that's exactly I think how. Uh, like I said, about 80% of the hams are. You want to get in there and get it on the air, and you think, okay, I'll get this. I'll, I'll run my grounds later. I'll, I'll, you know, when when I when it's time to put my tower up, I'll do this the right way. And maybe the day comes, and maybe it doesn't. But as you know, if you're out there making contacts, make some contacts. Well, you're spot that's on. It. That, you're spot on, Don. But you know, a lot of these guys have have trouble with noise, and yeah. if they would just get good grounding and bonding together, the noise would yeah. come down significantly and they could yep. make more contacts. Very true. Well, well, I've well that's got a what project. I want. That's <laughs> I want to make more contacts. So we're going to work on this. this I right. might have to document this. All, All right. right. Uh, let's wrap it up. We're over time. Uh, let's go over some nets tonight. We've got the D Star Net on 14 Charlie going on right now. We have DMR on TAC 311. We have the 40 meter net on 7192 and 75 meters on 3906. So if conditions are well, you can get in there and make some uh, contacts and say hello to our net controls. And we appreciate them very, very much. So with that, Dawn, wrap it up. All right, I've just happened to look in the chat room, and here's a, a question that just came in from Bill, WZ1L. Question for K3LR, and this is a great question. What if your station is on the second floor of your house? How do I ground via the electrical ground on an electrical box, Tim? You know, the second floor is very challenging, but I showed that, that radio ground plane that goes underneath the radio. That's very yeah. important you're on the second floor because you've got to create your own ground system. Oh, Victor, thanks very much for putting that up. And and so the one single point to the electrical ground to this radio ground plane and then every other item in the shack. So the radio, the computer, maybe a tuner, amplifier, all need to be bonded to this radio ground plane. And this is the best shot for having everything worked together as a system on the second floor. So this is the way to go. And, you know, all of the Ham Nation uh, uh, viewers, they can call us at DX Engineering or email us, dxengineering at dxengineering.com. Email us. We'll try and help you. Uh, we'll try and fix you up. If you've got RFI problems, noise problems, uh, we'll, we'll do our best. So, uh, Don, that that is a great question, and I hope that helps him. Yeah, that's that's a challenge. That second floor thing is a challenge. I just happened to say that in the chat room. It's like, yeah, perfect question. All right, Tim, thank you so much for being uh, with us again tonight. Uh, always enjoy having your expertise and friendly face on the program, and I'm sure uh, you'll be back later on with uh, with grounding 301. We just did 201 here. Uh, uh, good stuff. Thanks a lot. Appreciate you. 
And uh, George, thank you for being here with your stuff. And of course, uh, Gordon uh, up in the Costa Mesa and Amanda in the chat room. We were having some difficulties with Bob's video tonight, so uh, he had to uh, drop out because he just uh, couldn't be here. But that's all right. We'll get him back in here again next week. So for everybody here at Ham Nation, uh, thank you for watching and thanks for being here and giving us a reason to uh, be here with you on a Wednesday night. We appreciate it. And we will see you uh, next week. Oh, don't forget, we're just about a week away from the opening of the Young Ham of the Year nominating uh, uh, season. And there it is right there, arnewsline.org. There's a little box right there, Y-H-O-T-Y. You'll see it. Click that, and uh, that'll take you to past winners and also take you right to the Y-H-O-T-Y page. Those are some of the past winners if you want to look over those in the last 33 years. And uh, the, other, uh, the other link on there will take you to what is right now the uh, press release for the 2018 and that will be replaced with the 2019 nominating form on March 1st. So 90 days of nominating. And then, of course, the Young Ham of the Year Award being presented in August at the Huntsville, Alabama Ham Fest. So there you go. Young Ham of the Year time. Very exciting time for those of us here at Amateur Radio Newsline. We cannot wait to see who the 2019 Young Ham of the Year is going to be. So for all of us here at, uh, at, at Ham Nation and Amateur Radio Newsline, We'll uh, bid you a fond good night, and we'll see you next week. So good night, everybody. Seven three. Don. Seven three.